Well, uh, since time is short, and I have to give you an advance warning that uh, due to an oversight on my part, I'm actually double committed. I have to be somewhere. I have to be at the ICRC for a <coughs> discussion on uh, uh, social media and, and humanitarian issues. Uh, so I have, to reach, I have to leave sharp as soon as the session ends. Uh, so uh, I will keep things going along, and I will request our speakers to confine themselves to, 20, to 10 minutes. Now, it's evident that, <coughs> can everybody hear me? Uh, it's evident that of all the uh, crises or challenges confronting India and West Asia, nothing looms larger than the uh, evolving situation between Iran and Saudi Arabia. These are uh, two of India's most important, arguably two of India's most important uh, friends in, in the West Asian region. Uh, we have strong political ties, I would say, uh, stronger cultural ties with, uh, or historical ties with Iran than Saudi Arabia, but there is a strong and abiding economic and commercial connection. Um, you don't have a large Indian diaspora in Iran, but there's a large Indian diaspora in, in, in the kingdom. And uh, I dare say whatever happens between Tehran and Riyadh uh, would have uh, serious implications for uh, the millions of uh, Indians who live and work in the Gulf region. Managing uh, India's relations with these two powers at a time when their differences are sharpening, most recently uh, over the execution of Sheikh uh, Nimra Limra and the uh, sacking of the uh, Saudi embassy, and very sharp exchange of words. I don't know how many of you had a chance to read uh, Jawad Zarif's op-ed in uh, yesterday's New York Times uh, and the Saudi foreign minister's reaction to that, where he called it a joke. Uh, so there's very, uh, there do doesn't seem to be any signs of the uh, relationship easing. Uh, and if you look at uh, the evolving situation in, in Syria, Yemen, elsewhere, it's clear that this tension between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia will have consequences far beyond the uh, territories of these two states. So how India will manage this um, rising contradiction, particularly at a time when um, Prime Minister Modi uh, is eager to reach out to both countries. He's due to visit Saudi Arabia uh, later this year, and of course, uh, high-level contact with Iran has been continuing for, for many years and will, will carry on, is, I think, perhaps the most difficult challenge that mandarins in South Block have to negotiate. So helping us to shed light on this and uh, to suggest, to, to explain a bit about the uh, tension between these two powers and what India could do, we have a uh, stellar or very, very great panel of uh, speakers. And I will start with you, Professor Gulshan Deetu. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador Ahmed, for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. My orders are that I should not delve too much into history. So I dare not go back to Adam and Eve, but I definitely will have to go back to Prophet Muhammad. And that's where, the, after his death, that's where sectarianism in Islam came. And today, sectarianism in Islam has become fratricidal gradually over time, say in the past decade. How is sectarianism an issue between Saudi Arabia and Iran? The Saudi Islam stands alone today. The Muslim Brotherhood, it, it stands alone because Muslim Brotherhood has problems with Wahhabism and Shia Islam has problems with Wahhabism. And even within the Sunni world, Sunni Islam, Saudis do have uh, dissensions. All the Sunni states are not with Saudi Arabia. So Saudis, sect-wise, are in between ISIS on the one hand and Iran on the other, within the Sunni world. When it comes to Iran, Iran doesn't have any challenge within the Shia world, but Iran does have domestic challenge within the country where the hardliners and the reformers are trying to uh, fight it out. 
This is one issue that we are talking about constantly, sectarianism between the two. The second issue between the two is that both of them have this problem about how they manage the region. But if, and the nuclear issue, the nuclear issue is one major issue between the two. Surprisingly, nuclear issue has remained, uh, as we understand it, an issue between Iran and the US. And very little attention is paid <coughs> to the Iranian nuclear issue and the responses within the region, the repercussions on the region. And here again, Saudi Arabia's fears and Saudi Arabia's concerns need to be taken on board. Now, I have identified two issues between Saudi Arabia and Iran, sectarianism and nuclear issue. But if you scratch these two issues, just lightly, just very, very little, you would know that neither sectarianism nor nuclear issue are real issues. The real issue is that Iran is coming back to the world. Iran will become an entity in international community. The Iranian economy will integrate with the global economy. And what the Saudis hate the most is that there is a very open infatuation between the United States and Iran. They can see Iran and the United States casting furtive glances at each other. And this is something that Saudis just cannot stand. And this is happening. It's clear, it's happening, it's developing. So this really is the main issue. What about the confrontation that uh, Siddharth spoke about? In the past few months, let me go back just a little bit, a few months. In September, there was this Hajj pilgrimage in Makkah, and very often Hajj pilgrimage results in massive stampede. It happened this time also, and more than 2,000 people died. Incredible. <laughs> Out of those 2,000 people, roughly 500 were Iranian pilgrims who were crushed to death. Not only did they die, and Iran is still angry about it, but Iran accuses Saudi Arabia that the important people whose bodies have not been recovered are the people that the Saudis have held hostage. So this is one skirmish. And then, of course, Nimrel Nimrel. He is in a dark dungeon. Saudis pulled him out, executed him, and made him a martyr. Who would have bothered about Nimrel Nimrel spending some more years till he met his God in a Saudi jail? No one. Yeah, they made him a martyr. For what reason? What kind of a message to who the Saudis were trying to send? I don't understand very much. But it did happen. And then the Saudi embassy was put on fire. Then the Iranian embassy in Yemen was targeted by the Saudi missile, or so the Iranians say. So it's becoming very, very bad between the two. This is the background. Let me now quickly come to the proxy wars. They are fighting or they are supporting their constituencies in a whole range of countries, from Lebanon to wherever. But active war that is going on, where these two are involved, are the wars in Yemen and in Syria. In Yemen, the Saudi defense minister, who is also the deputy um, crown prince, 
He is only 29, so they say, but some say he's only 27. And all I understand from what he is doing is that he is trying to tell the world and tell his royal family that now, see, I have grown up. There is nothing else that I can read in his actions. He, and one of his uh, acolytes, he, uh, uh, the phrase is Salman doctrine. Like there used to be Eisenhower doctrine or Reagan doctrine or Clinton doctrine. Now there is Salman doctrine. And Salman doctrine is that the Saudis will have to fight on their own. Americans are not very reliable anymore because Americans are now trying to woo the Iranians. So Salman doctrine, not only that Saudis will have to fight alone, but they will have to set an example so that the others in the region can can make them the role model and fight their battles on their own. Not only does Salman doctrine remain a doctrine, but it was sought to be implemented. And this 29 or 27 year old defense minister, out of the blue in a press conference said, these are the 34 countries and we 34 countries are now forming an anti-terrorism coalition. Out of the 34 countries he named, Pakistan said, we don't even know this. We are caught off guard. And Malaysia said, we have nothing to do with this anti-terrorism coalition. So these are the things that the Saudis are trying to do when it comes to proxy wars in um, Yemen. And uh, Syria. The Yemen war seems to be having no exit. It seems to be go and the Iranians, they say Iranian boots are not on the ground in Yemen, but Iranian weapons and Iranian money is flowing there liberally. Iranian strategy when one looks at what is going on in uh, Yemen is to make Yemen Saudi Arabia's Vietnam. Let them fight, let them fight. There will be no end and Iranians will try to prolong the process as much as they can. Syria, it has been talked about today also. Syria is a little more complicated. They have uh, Saudis and Iranians both are now into some kind of a, uh, some kind of an effort to bring it to an end. But for Saudis, Bashar al-Assad is someone that they do not want continuing in uh, Damascus. On the other hand, the Iranians have made it very clear that Bashar al-Assad is our red line. Putin has been off and on supportive of Bashar. And now the West also seems to have co come around to the position that if Bashar goes, future could be even worse. So these are the two wars where the two Saudis and the Iranians are fighting through their proxies. I'll take one more minute and then what next? Two things. Number one, will there be a war? Our 27 or 29 year old defense minister has ruled it out. And he has ruled it out very strongly. He said anyone who talks about a war between us and Iran is out of his mind. So he, he, he makes sense because he knows that Saudis cannot with all the trillions of dollars of uh, weaponry that they have collected will not be very useful when it comes to fighting with Iran. So there will be no war. However, the divide between the Shias and the Sunnis will keep widening, keep deepening, and it will be with us for a couple of generations, to put it very optimistically. 
The second, that um, what next? Second, will Saudi monarchy be history? Is it the beginning of the end of Saudi monarchy as so many are talking about? I don't know. I don't know. In 1972, Fred Halliday, a very well-respected commentator on the Arab affairs, got a book published, 1972. The title of the book was Arabia Without Sultans. All the sultans in Arabia are alive and well. Only Iran has become Iran without sultan. So if from 72, people are talking about Arabia without sultan, I do not want to make any prediction whether it is the beginning of the end <coughs> of Saudi monarchy. But it's a question mark hanging, and people are talking about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dietl. Uh, I think you've, in a very telegraphic manner, uh, explain the broad contours of the uh, conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, um, and you've done it admirably in your allotted time. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Ms. Kanchi Gupta, 10 minutes. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm basically going to look at why is there this sudden escalation between Saudi Arabia and Iran? How does this fit into a sectarian framework and what are its overarching implications? Uh, it's relevant because Saudi Arabia and Iran have been engaged in a proxy war of sorts for many decades in varying degrees. And it's probable that this current escalation may not achieve very much because as we've already discussed, the maximum <coughs> impact could be felt on Syria, but the peace process in Syria has almost been considered stillborn. Secondly, the prospects for an end to the conflict in Yemen also seem bleak, and it does not appear that the US will walk away from the Iran nuclear deal. So uh, the storming of the Saudi embassy in Iran notwithstanding, uh, the execution of the Shia cleric was largely viewed as uh, an escalation from the part of the Saudi leadership. And what was most surprising was uh, that uh, with this execution, Saudi Arabia seemed to have crossed a degree with which it had dealt with Shia dissent in its country. After the 2011 uh, Shia uprising in Saudi Arabia, there was a violent crackdown. But since then, the protests had become smaller, and Saudi Arabia had largely resorted to using uh, legal measures to deal with uh, the Shia um, dissent. So no Shia cleric of this stature had been executed in Saudi Arabia in a really long time. So why this escalation now? Um, from the Saudi perspective, there are probably uh, two competing factors. One is uh, Riyadh's attempt to emerge as the leader of the Arab world. And uh, Riyadh is currently bolstered by the fact that it has a partnership with the UAE, that uh, traditionally powerful regimes like uh, Syria, Iraq, and Egypt are currently weak. And uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, primary Sunni rivals, uh, Qatar and Turkey, have suffered a number of setbacks. So they are at the point where they want to mend relations with uh, Riyadh. Also, Saudi Arabia seems to have overcome the challenges of the Arab Spring, and they have an aggressive leadership that's very keen to make its mark. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia is also very vulnerable. Its uh, forays into Yemen and Syria have not been very successful. Yemen is, in fact, largely considered a strategic failure. It's confronted with the rise of the Islamic State and also the Iran nuclear deal. And Saudi Arabia also faces domestic political challenges. Uh, one is the challenge to King Salman, and second is uh, falling oil prices. So while Saudi Arabia's foreign policy forays have not been successful, Iran has in fact emerged as um, uh, victorious since the 2003 upheaval in the region. Looking at the first factor in detail, uh, Saudi diplomacy has focused very largely on consolidating itself as the leader of the Sunni world. And we've seen recently the announcement of uh, the Islamic coalition where Saudi Arabia, in another attempt, tried to bring together Arab states in collective action through a joint force. But uh, this is severely limited because um, this unity that's being projected, particularly after the Riyadh conference when it comes to the Syrian opposition, does not take into consideration that Qatar and Turkey are still competing with Saudi Arabia when it comes to influence over uh, the insurgency. Uh, secondly, apart from Bahrain, none of the GCC countries seem to be following uh, Saudi Arabia's lead in severing ties with Iran. Even the UAE has only downgraded its ties with Iran, while uh, Qatar and Kuwait have called their ambassadors back. 
So Saudi Arabia has been largely unsuccessful in building a strong regional alliance against Iran. If you look at it in a purely sectarian framework, one would assume that all the Sunni regimes should automatically come together, but there are a lot of other contentions. Saudi Arabia has traditionally been closer to um, monarchs. It's now become closer to the anti-Muslim Brotherhood regime in Egypt, while uh, Turkey was closer to Qatar, particularly when Qatar was actively backing the Muslim Brotherhood, also to Egypt under Mohammed Morsi and to the uh, Hamas in Gaza. So even though sectarianism has sort of become a locus point for alliances in the region, its significance should not be overstated. Having said that, Saudi Arabia is using the attack on its embassy as a rationale for bringing together the GCC countries. Eventually, the GCC countries did come out with a statement saying that they, oppose, uh, they support any form of action that would be taken against Iran's belligerent policies, and they've praised Saudi Arabia's judicial system and uh, the action that it's taking against terrorism. So it's, continue, it's uh, clear that Saudi Arabia will continue its efforts to develop a Sunni alliance under its leadership. Uh, secondly, looking at the Iran deal, I think it's already been discussed, so I'll keep it very brief. Saudi Arabia does consider the Iran deal a threat to its regional position. They're very uh, insecure when it comes to the Americans. They haven't agreed with any of uh, the American policies in the last five years with regard to the Middle East. Um, particularly when it comes to the Iran deal, it comes to the situation in Egypt and um, uh, the U.S.'s approach to Syria. So with this sector in escalation, they probably hope to undermine some of these American policies, primarily the Iran deal and uh, the peace process in Syria, by inflaming tensions in a way that make diplomatic progress very difficult. With the Iran deal, they're unlikely to succeed. With Syria, they might. Demographically, also, this is an opportune time to inflame uh, sectarian sentiments. Many of uh, the Arab youth who were born after the 2003 uh, US invasion of Iraq are coming out political age now, and uh, this, they've only seen a violent sectarian conflicts in the region, and this sort of um, ideology is uh, embedded. And we have regimes like uh, Syria, Yemen, and Libya, where it's very useful to use sectarianism to take a hold amongst uh, polarized communities. And Syria's war in particular has become a very large incubator of sectarianism because there are massive campaigns from the Gulf uh, to support the Sunni Jihad against the Syrian regime and on the other hand from Iran and Hezbollah to mobilize uh, support for Assad around identity and sect. And there seems to be very little pushback from the Arab public sphere against this sectarianism. Coming back to Nimr's execution, Iran has also capitalized on this by using a lot of religious rhetoric around his death and presenting it as a form of Shia persecution. Iran, Hezbollah, and other Shia militias have released a number of songs, videos, and a lot of propaganda material in support of the cleric, and they've pronounced him a martyr. Therefore, Iran's also using this crisis to bolster its um, ideology, to expand its influence over the Shia communities in the region, and to showcase its ability to project power. So even if uh, the diplomatic rift between Saudi Arabia and Iran is eventually solved at some point, particularly through third-party mediation, it will be far more difficult to de-escalate these sectarian tensions than it has been to actually inflame them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was, again, a very good uh, uh, walk through all the issues. And we now have approximately half an hour to uh, have a discussion. Uh, broadly speaking, I would say, uh, based on the two presentations there, there are six or seven issues that have been highlighted uh, that we could focus on. Uh, there's the implications of Iran versus Saudi for Yemen. There is uh, the question of Syria. There is the, uh, the historical or sectarian issue and the possibility that uh, even if um, the Saudi defense minister is right that there's no prospect of war between Iran and Syria, but what shape could uh, proxy uh, war using proxies uh, terrorist groups and so on that owe allegiance to this or that brand of sectarianism, what role could that play? The shadow that the Saudi-Iran confrontation casts over the Iran-US uh, emerging relationship over the nuclear question, but also the broader rapprochement between Washington and Tehran. Uh, two other issues that I would flag, uh, one has already been partly uh, raised by, uh, by, by um, uh, Kanchi about the issue of domestic uh, and, and also by Professor Dietl, the, the domestic uh, stability uh, in Saudi Arabia and Iran looking forward. Uh, these are both young, growing countries uh, which are not democratic in the way that we understand them, but Iran has much greater safety valves uh, in place than the, than the Saudis do, which will obviously have its bearing on the domestic trajectory that these countries will take over the next decade. And last but not least, the, uh, the emerging economics of uh, the hydrocarbon sector because 
if you look at the long term secular decline in um, the price of oil which is evident now even if uh, even if there is some recovery but looking at the way in which energy uh, consumption patterns are, are changing over the next uh, and will change continue to change over the next decade it is clear that basing an economy purely on, uh, on hydrocarbons will place a country at some kind of disadvantage and here uh, the Saudis are staring at uh, a situation of decline as it were economically while the Iranians have a far more vibrant and multi branched economy uh, which will also have its impact on the uh, relationship between these two. So, these are the broad set of issues that appear to me we could focus on also of course the, uh, the Indian angle what are the, what are the uh, is, there a, is there a smart game that India could play uh, uh, that I mean it, it seems entirely possible that we could and we should um, build close and better relations with both Tehran and Riyadh at the same time, but might that prove to be impossible at some stage as things sharpen. Uh, these are some of the issues that I would like to throw open to the floor and if you can uh, General Saab please. But Mike did it. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to flag two issues. The opening speakers have spoken about it and the two present speakers. The first is sectarianism. We're all aware of sectarianism. I've been talking about this for years. It's been exacerbated because of the tension between Saudi and Iran. My question is that in this part of the world, it came up to Afghanistan, skipped Afghanistan, and got into Pakistan. Now, India has both the communities. I want to know, will there be any major effect on sectarianism in India and its subcontinent, especially now that the ISIS is there and Afghanistan is also seeing simmerings of this sectarian problem? The second, it was initiated by Ambassador Abhyankar, this role of India Saudi and Iran. I'd like a little more on this because in my view, the two common denominators between Saudi and Iran are we have good political relations with both and the common factor is the energy factor. We're getting it from both. I really can't see what further role India can play, especially when they said the diplomatic field should be intensified without getting one against the other as far as India is concerned. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let, let me collect two, three more questions and then we will, uh, Mr. Prakash. Um, thank you, thank you, Siddharth. Uh, I think uh, Tal Ambassador Talmiz Ahmad said that political Islam is a part of the consciousness of the people and we have to start with that reality. This was again, I think, reiterated by Ambassador Abhyanka saying that some vague idea of a secular or idealistic uh, or idea-based uh, view of the Arab world, of the Middle East is no longer tenable, that Islam as a central fact has to, be, has to be taken as a reality to start with. Then we come to sectarianism and both the speakers uh, in this panel seem to say that this too is to be taken as a reality, that this is deeply embedded in people's consciousness in both countries, younger people even more so. So you first start with something which is based on political Islam, a basic religious kind of a tenet. Then we say that the sectarianism is also a fundamental feature which we have to come to terms with. Now this, if you were to look at it as a kind of a normal Indian narrative or a Western narrative or a post-Western narrative in many other parts of the world is itself for me, a bit of a deviation. You start with these esoteric elements, first religions, then uh, sectarianism. Now, my question really is this. Uh, this kind of identity-based divisiveness in this part of the world, is it really based on identity, on non-material factors, on something which is, I would call it, regressive, on whatever sense of injustice we know all this, I mean, whatever the West has done, injustice, lack of legitimacy, all that. So is it based on these kind of ideas that has reduced the scenario to this? Or is it really, as uh, Mr. Abhyankar, Ambassador Abhyankar seemed to suggest, ultimately a power play 
into which these play out? Is it really the contest between Saudi Arabia and Iran, between the oil producing scenarios, between the lack of development? So is there a material kind of a base? Or is there something which is very difficult for me to grasp at least? Thank you for taking so long. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll take a third question from the young woman there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your session, Professor Dietl and uh, Kunchi. Um, I was, uh, so Professor Dietl, you, you'd said that it's really Iran coming back into the world, this possible uh, US-India rapprochement that is stoking regional tensions. And I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little more about um, the, the, this rapprochement, the effects of it domestically within Iran. Uh, do you really, do you see the uh, hardliner moderate divide um, uh, kind of being ramped up over this? Uh, and if not, is this divide still relevant? Um, and what are the issues that, um, that you, might, I, you might actually see these uh, lines being hardened up on? Thank you. But, so I think let's plunge into these three questions. Uh, there's the issue of... Uh, uh, The Americans invaded Iraq, and then it became not a, not an Iraqi resistance to the American occupation, but the sectarian divide between the Shias and the Sunnis in Iraq. This was 2004 onwards, and now this divide really is fratricidal. So far, so good, we are surviving, and hopefully we will. But otherwise, this identity at the popular level is becoming uh, relevant. At the political level, at the state level, this identity is a very good instrument play politics with each one, Syria, Bahrain, wherever you just look around, sectarianism is a very useful tool to do what you want to do. That's how I understand it. The Iranian domestic situation is extremely interesting. Okay. One and a half. <laughs> One and a half. <laughs> mm. From the time that Rouhani became the president and Jawad Zarif became very active, very high profile in the world, and the Americans came around and the nuclear deal was ultimately agreed to, the hardliners in Iran see the ground from under their feet slipping. Because if the system changes, if the Americans come in and start talking about freedom of press, gender equality, uh, you know, um, uh, political rights, where will these hardliners be? So these hardliners are really uh, very serious about grabbing the power. How? On 26th of February, there are two very crucial elections coming up in Iran. One is the election to the parliament, where the hardliners do want to um, uh, um, uh, grab as many seats and as much of power as they can. And they, would, they will not negate the nuclear deal with the US, but they would put breaks from the parliament. As I understand, the second election on the same day on 26th of February in Iran is the election for the experts' assembly. Experts' assembly is a very unique um, political entity 
in Iran, only the mullahs are members there. And these mullahs first have to write an examination, believe me, an examination to prove their theological uh, knowledge. Then there are elections, and there are 84 of them, and they meet only once in eight years, but they have the power to criticize the supreme leader, only they, they haven't so far, but in the Iranian constitution, they can advise and criticize the supreme leader, and they can appoint a supreme leader. They can also dismiss a supreme leader. So far, only one supreme leader there was who died, and the other supreme leader is ill. So everyone thinks that once this experts assembly is constituted, then that assembly will have the power to appoint the next supreme leader, which is a very, very major thing that this experts assembly can do. There are other interesting um, stories in this, but I leave it at that. So yes, you are right, the hardliners and the reformers, as they are called, uh, led by Rouhani, uh, are battling it out, and 26th of February is absolutely the day to watch. Anji, would you like to respond yes, to it? Uh, I can. I can. I can yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, sir, to your question about sectarianism in India, I think uh, Shias and Sunnis have, have be louder. Okay, I think Shias and Sunnis have lived in harmony. So, um, the bigger impact would be if India could become a theater of competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And there were some examples that we saw of that um, in the recent past. In 2014, I think there were about 20 to 40,000 Shias that wanted to travel to Iraq to, uh, for humanitarian purposes. So there was this idea of Shia persecution in the region that was probably pervasive in India at the time. And then there were some WikiLeaks cables which said that Saudi Arabia is very concerned about Iran's influence in India, so they want to establish Salafi centers. So I think the challenge for India in that sense would be to prevent the Indian Muslims from becoming um, sort of, again, proxies for Saudi Arabia and Iran. And that brings me to the second point about India, which you brought up, which is that India has for very long considered that we're insulated from what happens in the region and we've tiptoed around the developments. But I don't think um, that's a very viable option for a long time to come because the Gulf has been placing greater demands on India. They have said in the past that if we want to advance our commercial aims, we have to get involved in the politics of the region. So before there are any pressures on India that we cannot handle because we have interests, uh, vital interests with the GCC states as well as with Iran, I think we have to make ourselves um, appear as facilitators of dialogues under probably broader ambits of multilateral forums. But the time is definitely ripe to do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Sir. My question is to this panel, the next panel, Ambassador Talmiz, because uh, I've heard him speak at ORF in all the other places where these matters are discussed. We are shying away from worst case scenarios. And I'll just outline one or two because we require a separate day on those. And the worst case scenario, two of them, first, suppose the Saudi dynasty, unthinkable at the moment, is actually threatened and going to collapse. Pakistan has been firstly at the behest of USA and then on its own, regardless of what it says now when the Saudis demand Pakistan, the guarantor of the stability of the Saudi dynasty. One is by providing a division, a Pakistani brigade, and second is nuclear weapons. It's the Saudis along with Libya, who financed the nuclear weapons of uh, Pakistan. They have a lien on it. They're the only people in the world who even now, within Pakistan and outside Pakistan, can visit any Pakistan nuclear facility. So therefore, should that come about, where do we go? What is our position? This is a scenario that could play out, and we have to have a discussion on this. Right. Uh, I have time for one more question, if anybody wants to. Uh, Russell. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
it's actually a very brief point there is a strong uh, there is a significant uh, shia population in saudi arabia and as i understand they are uh, actually in all the oil producing areas is iran is there any evidence of iran doing something to exploit this could be the trojan horse and if something goes haywire what is the prognosis there worst case worst case my response would be that let these worst cases not happen but if they do i'm sure our ministry does have the contingency plans ready which i have no access to and i do not know what what the pakistan ultimately may do may be motivated to do by other and how the things will play out and where we would be standing i don't know i don't know you are right the saudi shias are sitting on the saudi oil which is what makes the situation so tricky is iran trying to have special relations or trying to uh, use them as the trojan horse so far there are no indications that are reported <coughs> nimra nimra who was executed and the iranians have now taken up his cause nimra nimra they say had more to do with the rest of the isis uh, persons who were executed with him then he had to do with the shia theology because what he spoke throughout for which he was imprisoned and uh, ultimately executed he was talking less about theology and more about getting rid of the uh, awesome. saudi monarchy so one does it and they are since they are a minority and since they are resisting the saudi injustices or oppression or whatever uh, they are trying to trying to say that they are as saudi as the others that they may have sympathies for the iranians maybe that one doesn't know but these people even the bahraini shias are trying to say that we are as bahraini speaking arabic so briefly um i can just make a quick point about uh, pakistan uh, it's very evident that pakistan is also feeling the pressures of what's happening in the region they've seen the impact of the shia sunni conflict within their own borders which is why they want to sort of distance themselves from the confrontation they refused to uh, take part in the yemen operation um, i think immediately after that they hosted a jawad zarif they also did not like the idea of this new islamic coalition so they are definitely uh, feeling the pressures of that and uh, they've also recently made statements that the oic platform should be used for um, some sort of mediation between saudi arabia and iran thank you um i have yeah, a few minutes that i have left i just want to make some concluding uh, for sir briefly uh in this debate i just like to make one point is the question of uh, what goes into making an identity is it just religion or is it also nationalism this is very important to realize that there is different nationalisms at play persian arab turk etc and the second aspect is the religious aspect with the shia sunni etc so is iraqi shia an arab or iraqi shia a shia first that is what has to be determined and in the question of eastern provinces this will be a very important aspect which uh, professor detel was hinting at and i would like this august audience to keep that in mind that is not as simple as just shia sunni but various nationalisms also come into play thank you thank you i'll, I'll take that as a as a comment and add my own closing remarks uh, in response to that uh, I, you know you see when we talk of worst case scenarios uh, the 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 danger to the house of saud if it manifests itself in a way that actually threatens uh, the saudi state is likely to be internal 
and uh, nuclear weapons, whether Pakistani or clandestinely obtained or whatever, are not really of much use uh, in such a scenario. Uh, the Pakistan nuclear factor comes into play in the event of a confrontation, military confrontation, which I think we're all agreed is quite unlikely between Iran and, uh, and, and KSA. Uh, the irony about the Salman doctrine is that uh, it has proved spectacularly ineffective against a weak and uh, isolated force like the Houthis. And uh, I think this is probably also a factor in uh, pushing the young defense minister into acknowledging that war between Iran is unthinkable. Uh, you, know, the, you know, the Indian angle, I think, is what I would like to uh, just you know, conclude on. I, I, I agree with my panelists, uh, co-panelists, that uh, I don't see much prospect of a deterioration of Shia Sunni uh, uh, relations. I think that there are dangers of sectarian divisions and there are plenty of other uh, people who are busy creating a toxic mix uh, in this country. Uh, but I fear that the front lines of the uh, Shia Sunni, and I use this term uh, guardedly. I think Ambassador Singh is quite right that often these are masks for uh, other kinds of conflicts. But uh, even if the people in Iraq or Turkey or Iran or Saudi Arabia have a religious or a sectarian identity and a national identity, uh, that doesn't preclude them uh, using whichever identity is convenient in order to build uh, proxy allies. And my fear is that the, the front line for this uh, conflict is actually uh, ha going to happen on India's borders. And you can see it playing out in Pakistan, where uh, what they call takfiri groups who are busy declaring uh, this or that uh, Muslim to be non-Muslim. And uh, uh, you know, there, there seems to be an escalation. And, uh, we still don't know, there is no great clarity, quite frankly, in terms of the attitude of the Pakistani state as to how it is going to deal with these. Yes, they have moved against uh, LEJ, for example, uh, and uh, they have been rather more strict with the, uh, this strand of uh, extremism in Pakistan than, of course, the anti-Afghan or the anti-Indian terrorist groups. But um, how uh, durable will this be? Uh, how much of a, of a sea change has there been on the part of the Pakistani establishment? Because the rise of sectarian groups within Pakistan uh, uh, was you know, entirely because of patronage by the military. And uh, so I think that this is, this is one worrying factor that, so India can't really avoid, uh, uh, you know, India has to keep its eyes focused on this uh, sectarian division, uh, even if I, I'm quite confident within our borders uh, there should not be any great manifestation of this. Uh, final point is really on what India's options are. And, you know, my sense is that uh, this is such a treacherous minefield to get into, uh, to, to try to play the role of a balancer or try to play the role of a negotiator or try to play the role of a mediator, that uh, India's best bet is perhaps to uh, stick to uh, a legal, legalistic position. So, for example, when it comes to Syria, uh, we will deal with the Syrian government. And so, uh, Walid Mualim was here, and of course, he would have wanted India to step up its commitments in his interview that he gave me for Rajya Sabha TV. He says India should, uh, it seems so unreal, he says India should be investing in the Syrian economy now. And I, <laughs> and I said, how is that possible? And he said, no, there are lots of countries that are, that are waiting to do this, and India should get to the front of the queue. Uh, so, obviously, India should not uh, go overboard in uh, its associations, but uh, with the benefit of hindsight, the view that India took in the UNSC uh, on the uh, wider war that the West wanted to create post Libya and on Syria uh, has proved to be uh, a very wise one. And uh, were it not for uh, the restraint that finally came, uh, you would have had a, a much worse uh, uh, situation in Syria, much worse sectarian divisions, and a highly unstable. Uh, um, Know, epicenter that would have radiated, radiated problems ar uh, around the wider region. Uh, so my sense is that, you know, uh, as far as, as it is possible, building closer economic, political, uh, strategic relations with uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and Iran is something that we should attempt to do. Uh, as and when uh, differences become irreconcilable between those two, uh, India may have to reevaluate its options, but uh, I don't see uh, any great uh, a purchase in stepping up one's political engagement exactly. 
uh, and uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, resolve uh, some of these issues when uh, they really are quite intractable and it could well turn into a lose-lose uh, situation. On that note, uh, I know that there's still a couple of people who have their hands up, but we'll have to end it here, sir. Maybe you can intervene in a future session. Thank you very much. Thank you to my panelists.